So I want to thank you all for being with us today and welcome you to the final panel of the afternoon. For those of you whom I haven't met yet, my name is Andrea Donahue and I am the Global Records and Archives Manager for the Ford Foundation. As information professionals, we have a gift. We have a gift for finding knowledge and wisdom almost anywhere. As a parent, I often find knowledge and wisdom in the movies I watch with my kids over and over <laughs> and over again. And so it was sometime around the 436th viewing of the Lego movie <laughs> that I realized the central theme of that movie was speaking to me as an information management professional. It goes a little something like this. <clears throat> Everything is awesome. <laughs> Everything is cool when you're part of a team. <laughs> Anyone who has seen that movie is going to have that song in their head for the rest of the day. But really, it's, it's very appropriate for this panel because it's all about teamwork and collaboration and working together. All of the amazing panelists that you're going to hear from today have their bios in the guidebook app. And so as they come to the podium to present their case study to you, they're just gonna start with a brief introduction, uh, introduction names, titles, and organization. And they're gonna, they're gonna walk you through a, a project that they worked on together that allowed one of the organizations to move the overall goal of their archives, records, or knowledge management program forward. And then we're gonna circle back around and talk about some of the key lessons learned, and we'll open it up for questions. So without another moment's delay, Amy and Jamie. Oh. Hi, everybody. Can you hear me? Yeah. All right. My name's Amy Gibson, and I'm a senior program manager of archives at the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. And you can kind of think of me as a liaison to the Gates Archive. So I'm at the foundation looking across the organization to see what's being created and what we want to preserve. I'm Jamie Qualino, and I am, I'm going to stand a little farther away. I am the manager of archive services at Gates Archive. What that means tangibly is that I oversee a team of archivists who are responsible from, for donor relations, acquisitions, processing, access and outreach, and oral history. Sorry. Okay, so now that you know a little bit about us, we're going to talk about who we are organizationally. Um, so the Gates Archive is a consolidated archive for the personal and philanthropic records of Bill and Melinda Gates. So that does include the records of the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, where Amy works. Um, and we collect information in any format, physical or digital, and you can imagine, as you all work at our uh, foundations and have a sense of what types of materials those are, so I won't go into that. Um, but really, as our mission and vision up here states, we're really trusted to mindfully capture these materials using advanced technology and really provide controlled access. So I think important to note is that we are a private archive. Uh, that being said, we very actively work with our partners like Amy and the foundation to support their business needs. And the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation was officially formed in 2000. Um, with the vision that all lives have equal value. And there's four missions that help us achieve that vision. Um, ensuring that more young people and children survive and thrive, empowering the poorest, combating infectious disease, and then inspiring others to action. And it's actually in the spirit of advancing all of those missions that we're partnering with the Gates Archive to preserve our history so that people can learn from our work, both our successes as well as our challenges. Um, and um, we're going to talk a little bit about um, a specific partnership today, but first we want to share um, a few others that we've worked on as well. There were so many, we had a hard time mm -hmm. picking which one to focus on, so there's a few that we just want to tell you about now. Great. So we've been working over the past few years, uh, like Amy mentioned, on a few key activities, and as many, I think as many other people have talked about, milestones are often a way for those opportunities to fall into your lap. Um, so at the foundation's 15th anniversary, we were actually 
we had the opportunity to be involved. The archive was present at some of those planning meetings. And so one of the items that was um, brought up in those meetings was the, a timeline. So really the idea was for the archive to create an authoritative timeline of the foundation's history. We said, great. We looked at our collections and we circled back with a timeline. Um, and it was a really interesting experience because we made uh, that timeline based on our holdings. And some people might, they looked at it and they thought, well, wait, what about this event or that event? And, you know, we let them know, you know, if we don't have the records, we actually can't put it on the timeline. <laughs> so it became an interesting donor relations conversation. Um, but ultimately we now have this great record of the foundation's history that we can, as collections are added, we can augment and um, continue to iterate on. The second thing, um, somewhat related, the executive office open house. So this was a chance for us to bring a less formal timeline into the executive office space, um, also relating to, and it's the bottom right corner, you can see there's a window and there's some stuff on it. Um, those are photos and things we recreated, kind of fun things like post-it notes, just to bring the timeline to the staff in that space. And that was just a fun creative thing that we did. The photo on the upper right hand side is from our US Library Program um, Archive Roadshow. And this was really fun. It was a collaboration between the archive and our alumni program. So if you remember, the foundation was created um, in 2000 and the archive started in 2011. So we operated for about a decade without an archive or without even an archive mindset. So we invited back a bunch of alums who had boxes um, of stuff. We collected a ton of materials. We put up photos that we needed to ID the people in the photos. And a lot of these early folks knew who people were. So that was a really fun collaboration. Um, and then lastly, our records management program. We just did a refresh this year, and I'm so happy to say that we have <laughs> finally, after four years of working with our legal team who own our records management program, we have refreshed the policy to include preservation of records in the purpose. Um, so this has been a lot of work. Um, it's been a great partnership with the archive and with our legal team. Um, we also refreshed our schedule to list out every type of record that should also be transferred to the archive with disposition and guidance and that as well. So that was another great uh, partnership. So like I said, this is just a few examples. Um, the one that we're going to talk about today is about a visit that we made to one of the foundation's regional offices. Um, in December of last year, Jamie and I made the long trek to our India country office, which was really fun. And just for background, um, the India office is one of eight regional offices um, around the world that the foundation has, along with our headquarters in Seattle. And it was actually our first international office. So it was established in 2003. And um, it's based in Delhi, where about 80 people work. Um, and we have a handful of staff who work remotely across the continent. Um, and our team, our team's work there is mostly focused on Uttar Pradesh, UP, and Bihar. Um, so now that you know a little bit about the office, Jamie's going to talk about our approach to the trip. Yep. That's it. Okay. So <clears throat> we had three primary goals for the trip, and these goals are two, at least two of them, are very closely aligned with the Gates Archives goals. Um, the first is actively capturing history in the making. Um, what does that mean? Uh, we know that people at the foundation are making history every single day, and we want to make sure that we're capturing that as part of the work and the investment that Bill and Melinda are making. So we had heard that there were some old program files in that office that were just waiting for the archive, so we were eager to see them. That was one driver. The second is that we suspected that people may have been saving things outside of some of the sanction systems that they were supposed to. Just suspected at this time. And we know that sometimes things don't get documented and there might be things about the culture or the history of the office, its evolution, that we're not going to get through records. And we wanted to do something about that. Um, so we'll talk a little bit more about how we did that later. Um, the second is connecting users to content. Most explicitly, this happens through access to the collection content. We wanted to let staff know in the India office what they already could access from the foundation's collection. And we also wanted to let them know the value of transferring their records so that they could provide continued value and use to them in their business. So there's a little near term and long term in that. And then underlying all of this, we wanted to test out this experience, which we acknowledge is an investment of resources and time to see 
if it really was, we wanted to use it as a test case um, for visiting other regional offices and demonstrate the benefit of not going just once, but perhaps having recurring engagement with his team and then also having that relationship in place for when they came back. Ooh, we're halfway. Um, so those are some of our goals. So you might be wondering what strategy we use to gain approval um, for a visit like this. And we started out doing a lot of research and planning. Um, so we talked to staff in the Seattle office, in the regional office. We also talked to archive staff to understand what did we already have in terms of materials from that office. Um, we identified needs and collection gaps and then kind of brainstormed what we thought we could accomplish with a visit like this um, and ultimately came up um, with some draft goals. We took those goals to our managers and got tentative buy-in and support, knowing that we'd build out um, further like a business case. Um, and so that business case outlined the specific goals of the visit, but also how, the vi how those goals rolled up to our foundation archive program goals and the division goals of my boss's boss. So and I think this was really key and helped show like strategic alignment. Um, the business case also listed some proposed activities that we were thinking of doing, um, the expected benefits of the visit, some logistics, and some other details. And it was actually just a really simple email format um, that we submitted to both of our respective managers for approval. And um, it was approved, which was great. And following approval, we had the foundation executive sponsor um, who is our chief business operations officer. She actually reached out to the country director to seek support and um, sponsorship for the visit. And a main point of contact was identified for us to work with so that we could um, have a local person to then build out the agenda and schedule. Okay, so once we were on the ground, we wanted to have a plan. I'm a planner. I thought this would be very helpful. So um, the plan we laid out was first of all to promote the archive. We wanted to do this formally through a presentation and overview, and this is something we do in Seattle. Um, so we wanted to bring that to the India country office. We also thought it would be a good idea, and this ended up happening um, once we were on the ground, um, that we just wanted to introduce ourselves to people. So we introduced ourselves to people, um, we went around the entire office and just went up to folks and people were like, this is amazing, no one ever does this, thank you. Um, we also sat in the lunchroom and that was a great way to informally connect with staff as well. Um, and that was also a great and tasty experience. Um, the second thing we did is that we had some of the staff at the office give us an overview. So we had them help us learn about their role, their work, where they were saving materials. Through that, we were able to do land, conduct landscaping sessions. So we identified, okay, you're saving stuff in SharePoint, great. Oh, it's on your local drive, okay, good to know. And we were then able to look at the materials, appraise the content, determine how to transfer it over. And then the other thing we did, um, and this relates to the capturing some of that local culture that I talked about, we wanted to conduct informational interviews with selected staff. So we were very mindful, this is not a formal oral history, it's not a life history, this is a very targeted session about your experience working in this office over the years. So that is the approach we took and Amy will talk about what happened to the best lead plan. Um, so was our goal achieved? Yes, but not in the way we anticipated. Um, so like any well-laid plan, we got there and everything kind of changed. People had meetings with government officials they couldn't um, change. And so we almost tore up our whole schedule and started from scratch, um, which we'll talk about more in our lessons learned. But um, although you know it wasn't in the way we thought, we did achieve a lot. Um, our plans changed as we learned more about the office and its records and our scope of what we were there to collect expanded and shifted. Um, so like Jamie said, the boxes, the all the old boxes of files that we were there to supposedly get um, didn't seem to exist. However, a lot of other stuff did, so we were able to collect that. Um, so some notables from our visit, um, the impact. Um, so we strengthened relationships. A lot of staff hadn't heard about the archive yet. Um, so it was a chance um, for them for the first time to learn about the archive and learn about their role in preserving materials and their role in making history. For others that had heard about it, it was just a, a chance to deepen those connections. Um, we collected loads of content like we've alluded to through the uh, landscaping sessions, informational interviews. 
Um, and we even collected files that uh, we wouldn't have gotten otherwise because we were there that specific week. So actually the timing of our visit was really critical um, because those staff uh, were based remotely and they were only in India because it was home week. Um, so, um, and then lastly, uh, another key impact was uh, that we were able to learn a lot from this visit and we sort of thought of it as a pilot so we could understand what, what we would uh, maybe do differently next time and we'll be able to um, take the, the experience and the key takeaways for any future visits that we make. And I think we're gonna hold there. Yep. All right, thanks. Good morning, good afternoon, everyone. So I'm Justine um, Greenland Duke, Associate Director of Knowledge Management at the MasterCard Foundation. And I'm Eric Abrahamson, a Principal Historian with Vantage Point History. So we're going, we're here to talk a bit about, this one do you think? Yeah, uh, our oral history project. Um, as a collaborative effort that Eric and I were both involved in. Um, and in, in order to do that, I'm just gonna set it up a bit so that you understand the context in which we did this work. So um, you may not be familiar with the MasterCard Foundation. We're a relatively young organization. In fact, this oral history project uh, occurred around our 10th anniversary. And because we bear the same name as the MasterCard International Credit Card Corporation, it's easy to assume that we are, in fact, part of that organization, which we're not. We were created um, because of the generosity of that organization and when it became public in 2006, when they contributed a share of, of, um, um, of their assets and created an independent foundation. And so we have since operated as an independent foundation with um, uh, an independent leadership team, management team, board of directors, and we are in fact uh, based in Toronto, Canada. So also another regulatory environment. Um, the MasterCard Center for Inclusive Growth is in fact uh, an associated organization that also works in the same geographic region that we do, which is Africa. And we do a lot of partnership with them. We share a lot of pride in the work that all three organizations do. Um, but we, we, again, independently, we operate independently. And um, we are also a very fast growing organization. So I, when I started four years ago, we were at 60 employees. And by the end of this, uh, this year, we're going to be close to 200. Um, we're currently working in 34 African countries with 118 active partnerships. Um, we've dispersed $1.6 billion in funds to date but committed 2.2. Um, .2. Um, all right, so that's just the, the current context I, for those of you who aren't familiar with the foundation. So um, for the first decade, we really operated as a, as a very well-funded startup. And it was a, an amazing period of time where there was large-scale experiments underway. Our program staff co-designed all of our partnerships. Um, right from the, the minute of inception, the first idea was uh, we, we've never received unsolicited applications. So all of our work is, v is very, um, it's co-designed, co-created with the partners that are going to implement the, the initiatives. Um, for, that f for that first decade, our project budgets, budgets were very large. So on average, the board approved budgets were about 10 million per project. And these were long-term investments. Uh, we had um, uh, our board approve for the, f for the first, I think it was the first seven years or eight years, all of the projects. But then now our CEO has more delegated authority and is approving some of those large scale projects as well. Our management team still has um, the ability uh, to approve projects up to $250,000. And so I guess what I'm trying to say is that we had a lot of autonomy. We, we really based that first year, those first years on hiring smart people with really good experience and strong networks and delegated authority to them to move quickly and um, start to identify where it was, where we were best suited to have impact. 
and really to build out that um, that really important network that our that our work relies on so heavily. So um, as we moved toward our 10th anniversary, we decided to prepare for a strategy renewal. And um, we planned a year of reflection and learning, which is, a, again, a real privilege. And I look back on that period of time and think, wow, how lucky are we to have had a board and to have a leadership team who said, we need to take a break and really just look back at our first decade and understand who we are, why we're here, and, and what we really want our future to look like. So in order to reorient the leadership as well as the rest of the organization toward this new phase, we initiated the Oral History Project. And that's why we brought Eric and his team to the organization. So he's going to speak a bit about the project now. Great. Thanks, Justine. So this was a really fun project for us. Um, I am by training a, a business and organizational historian, and I have a particular geeky interest in regulation. And the MasterCard Foundation story is remarkable. I think it's really probably one of the only uh, foundations that was created as a result of an antitrust suit. And um, that's a longer story than we can really get into today, but um, it's a fascinating way in which the foundation came to be. So our project was to kind of... Um, Anniversaries provide an opportunity for organizations to think back and understand who they are, and they also provide an opportunity to go back and test the abiding myths that are within the organization. So part of what we were trying to do was really document the founding and understand all the process that fed into that process. So we were tracing the roots of the organizational culture and values, trying to understand where these embedded routines come in. A lot of times organizations are doing things they don't even know why they're doing them. And they have to do with what I call the Big Bang Theory of corporate culture. Something happened right at the beginning in the way that organization came into being that is still permeating that culture long after anyone remembers why it came to happen. So we had to do this by trying to identify materials. And as Justine was explaining, it's a pretty much still a very young organization. Uh, archives and you know records management was in place, but it was still very much trying to be put together on the fly. And as I said earlier this morning, one of the challenges was finding the kinds of documents and materials that we as historians are used to working with. So we looked at grant files, we looked at board minutes, all those kinds of things. We built some key assets like a chronology, we built, and we took on this oral history project. So the oral histories, we did about 22 oral histories with former board members, with key executives also with people at the MasterCard company. And as Justine said, when the, when the foundation was born, for good and, and important reasons, there was efforts to really separate the two. It's kind of like a teenager going off to be on their own, and they didn't want anything to do with their parent. And the foundation, naturally, sort of had this kind of a relationship in the beginning to the company. So they didn't really have access to the senior executives at MasterCard who had, in a sense, been part of the creation. So thoughtfully, though, um, the foundation asked us to go interview them, interview senior leaders, so we did that. And we learned that MasterCard strategy, business strategy, had shaped the foundation in important ways. They were important to people at the foundation. Foundation was put in Canada because um, the MasterCard is an American company. They had just bought a big credit card company in Europe, and the American and the European directors couldn't decide who would get the foundation, so they settled on Canada, or neither one of them were. Which, and there were interesting repercussions, as Justine said. It has a different regulatory environment, and that impacted their style of grant making in important and constructive ways, because I'm a fan of how re regulation can be constructive sometimes. In this case, in Canada, it certainly was. So there was a lot of learning by doing that was reflected in the oral histories. We also did two case studies for them, one that documented the founding, and we did one on their partnership strategy, which is their grant-making strategy that emerged from their philosophy of how they wanted to grow. They wanted a lean staff in the beginning. They wanted deep relationships with their grantees. Um, they wanted to do big grants. They made the decision to focus on sub-Saharan Africa, and out of that emerged a corporate culture. And the last thing that we did was we also created, just for internal use, a narrative history. This isn't a published document. It's just a resource. Because part of what we were talking about earlier this morning is that you have all these digital assets 
that make up your archive, and people don't have, have time anymore to synthesize them and build the story out of them. So we put together a narrative history that identified the themes in the organization's history that helped people understand what are the things that are not going away in who we are and that we have to deal with one way or another, either as a strength or a weakness, or about who we are. And so that's what that narrative history is designed to do. So I don't know if you just got an impression of what it's like to work with Eric, but I, I also wanted to just comment on the fact that he brought um, a value to the work that really aligned with ours, which is humility. And he wasn't there to judge or assess. He was there to help surface insight and to help us hold up a mirror and, 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 and find, a, find a narrative about the organization and how we had evolved. And really an explanation to a certain degree about who we had become over those first, um, those first 10 years. Uh, he also met the organization where it was at. And even since then, we have evolved. So the conversations that he and I have now are like, wow, you know, maybe we could revisit that. Maybe we're in a better place to, to talk about those things now. Or maybe there's a way to, to share more broadly what we learned. So it's, it's an evolution. It's, it's really a long game. And we'll speak a little bit about that more um, as, a, as a part of lessons learned. Um, so I'll just tell you a bit about what the project led to and has influenced. So very early on, uh, we established a knowledge management program at the foundation, or I should say we initiated it. But it took, it took some time to establish the program and actually staff it and build capacity. Um, the, it, and Eric mentioned we're, we're a digitally native organization. So, you know, it's funny when I actually get a hard copy of something and I'm like, wow, this is cool. I should do something special with it. Um, uh, so, so, you know, some of what we've talked about today, I'm, it's, it's really foreign to me, to be, to be perfectly honest. The knowledge management program is situated inside of a team called, or a department called strategy and learning. Um, and we are uh, book, kind of bookended by two other teams. One is the research team, uh, which has a newly formed mandate for um, commissioning research that drives our new strategy, and also a learning and insights team, which works very closely with our partners on real-time learning and, and improving the way that we actually implement our, our projects. Um, we work really at the intersection of the rest of the organization's, you know, mandates, including especially operational excellence and digital transformation and, and innovation. The CAM portfolio, like a, is, I think, is quite rare at the foundation, but it has been informed very much about um, by those first years of work. Um, so we oversee uh, data strategy, data management, and analytics. We oversee all knowledge and information systems, which includes our grants management systems, our measurement outcomes, um, or our outcome me our outcomes measurement system. We will be in CRM, you name it. Anything that can be kind of classified as a knowledge or information system is under our, our um, oversight. We also do a lot of external data publishing, um, more and more so. So the standards by which we do that is under our, our oversight. And enterprise information management, which we've actually spent a lot of time on over the last um, four years. There's also one new kind of area of work, which is on the change management components of CAM. So what are the communications and the training needs that our staff have that, that we really need to own and take responsibility for? So I mentioned the um, knowledge and, and, and information system itself, uh, but I'll just focus uh, right now on our current priorities. And um, uh, in 2015, we did a, a MVP or a minimum viable product of Office 365. And we're now at the point where we're scaling that up to be an enterprise information management system and migrating the entire organization to the cloud. Um, that's been, that has involved tagging and structuring 900 and 4,000 digital files, 75% of which are program related. Um, we're updating our taxonomy, we're finalizing our data strategy, and this is going to have implications with the way that we work with our partners and how the, our partners commission, produce, and manage data. 
we're running a lot of country pilots. So as a part of our implementation of our new, pro uh, our new strategy, we're opening offices in African countries. And um, the, there's a lot of piloting underway to try and understand what are the best mechanisms by which data is produced, generated, managed, and collected. Um, and, it's, and it's requiring a lot of capacity building. Um, we are starting to think more about knowledge translation, both internally and externally. And uh, we're planning a really large scale transformation of all of our systems. All of this, though, <laughs> is, is, is almost predicated on the need for our records management program and archive plan. And this, the seed for this was planted as a part of the oral history project. And I don't think we would have really recognized the need for it until we, if we hadn't done this exercise. And so as a part of this oral history project, when Eric was here uh, at the organization, I said, look, this is a perfect opportunity. Let's put some recommendations in place about what a records management pro program would look like and what an archival plan would look like. We won't get to it right away because there's a whole lot of other stuff we need to do to prepare the organization for this. But when the time comes, we'll have this plan in our back pocket and we'll be ready to act. And the time is now. We'll do lessons learned. And we'll do lessons learned a little later. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> so, good afternoon. My name is Sam Markham, and I am the director at the Winthrop Group, uh, information and archival services consulting firm based here in New York City. We also have a histories division, and I oversee the archive side of things. My name is Michael Walter. I'm special assistant to the president at International House, where I focus heavily on advising the president uh, on the board matters, and also get special projects, such as an archive project. So uh, with that, we'll go ahead and get started. Opera singer Leontine Price, transportation executive Tetsuro Toyota, philanthropist Catherine Davis, award-winning author Chinua Achibe. What do they have in common? As graduate students, they lived at International House. International House was founded almost 100 years ago by the Rockefeller and Dodge families. It's a nonprofit, and it was founded with a remarkable vision. If you could get young people from around the world to live together, they could learn how to bridge differences of ethnicity, culture, and background, and this would contribute to world peace. Today, International House is a thriving community of 700 graduate students. It has 60,000 distinguished alumni. It is a lived experience. What it offers cannot be taught in any classroom. Its values are respect, empathy, and moral courage. In a day and age of identity politics, social inequalities, and worldwide political unrest, we believe these values are as vital as they have ever been. Despite accumulating almost 100 years worth of documents, International House has never had a formal archives program. In 2018, we began to rectify this. We engaged the Winthrop Group to help us get a better understanding of our options and potential long-term management and access to the records. There were multiple drivers for this partnership. First, our endangered historical records had reached a state of criticality. Quite simply, the House's records were and are falling apart. Second, International House celebrates its centennial in 2024. There's a familiar theme going on here. Without access to our archives, there's no way we could celebrate this centennial properly. We would lose opportunities for reflection, context, and innovation, some of the most exciting aspects of a centennial. Third, the House is about to embark on a mission-driven building expansion project. This building expansion project is going to impact the current spaces where the documents are stored. We knew the building expansion project gave us a remarkable, perhaps a once-in-a-lifetime, opportunity to re-envision for decades to follow how we would use our archives. Fourth, we had support from the President. Indeed, it was more than support. He wanted his team to lead on this project. Fifth, resources became available for a short-term archive project. These resources came to us in the form of a small grant and allowed us to engage Winthrop. Because of this small grant, we've been able to move forward in ways we could have only dreamed of. 
several years ago. So Sam and I could not resist. Uh, we wanted to give you uh, a shot or two of uh, the horror that was our archive spaces. Um, I remember the first time I went down into these rooms, I thought, they're going to find my skeleton here. I'm going to die here. So um, anyway, with that, I'll turn it over to Sam. Thank you. Um, so as you could see from those, that photograph, uh, the, it was quite chaotic in the basement. And those were some of the nicer photographs. They were, um, so the records were really chaotic. Uh, there were no inventories whatsoever to use. Um, and so we were tasked with coming up with some plan, a plan for the long-term management of the house's archival assets. And one thing they requested was that we develop a detailed plan for uh, creating an archive program at the house and some other options. Uh, so our first priority was obviously to get a sense of the overall landscape of non-current records at the house. Um, to that end, we had two Winthrop archivists surveying for six weeks and in doing the baseline inventory of the records that were, again, scattered around the, the house. Um, and then f that really helped us articulate where, where are the records, what departments do they belong to, where the, uh, and also what, what percentage of this is archival, what is non-archival. Um, I should note that the House, shortly before we started on this project, had uh, adopted a records retention policy. And while some of the boxes had mixed series and it was impossible to do a quick sort of uh, disposition decisions for those, we were able to look at the financial records um, that were stored in one room. and using the records retention schedule, identify 100 cubic feet of records that were eligible for immediate disposition. So, um, and we were also flagging audiovisual assets that needed sort of urgent reformatting. Um, so while my colleagues were busy with the survey and inventory, I had the opportunity to speak with 19 different stakeholders uh, at International House. These included two trustees, the president, and two former presidents, uh, as well as all the key staff uh, around International House and various departments. Um, and those interviews were really crucial for developing an idea of different priorities, objectives, and interests, or lack of interest in the archive, the idea of an archive program. And it also surfaced frustrations, current frustrations with the inaccessibility of the archive, as well as a, a real interest in trying to benefit from the records. Um, so I should also note that the house, one other person I was able to speak with was a former director of development. And he mentioned that when he arrived at International House, they showed him the archive, which was, was really a sort of a file room. And they had been amassing sort of older records in this space. But it wasn't an operational archive, and it really wasn't. And so that was about of the 1,700 cubic feet that we surveyed, that was only, I think, 250 cubic feet were that original archive. Um, so there had been a, a mass accumulation over the years of departmental records. Um, and the, the records themselves were incredible, correspondence, uh, documents going back to the founding of, of International House, uh, David Rockefeller speaking at, at the house, Peter Seeger concert at, at the house. Um, so really very rich records. Um, so once we had uh, completed the stakeholder interviews as well as the recommend, uh, the survey, uh, we went back and, and sort of gathered our thoughts and came up with a recommendations, a findings and recommendations report, uh, which basically outlined two options. One was that the House had been speaking with Rockefeller Archive Center since the early 2000s about the possibility of transferring select records to to uh, RAC, so that was one option. And then the other was to continue that conversation with RAC. And the other was to try and establish an in-house archive, which there seemed to be a big appetite for within within the house. Um, so our, our report laid out a sort of, in terms of the option with establishing an archive in-house, we had a, a, a project or work plan, a two-year work plan, a budget and timetable, as well as additional information and costs for digital asset management system, collection management system, archival supplies budgets, sort of a full scope of what you would likely be 
need, needing to spend in, in an initial period of, of work on the archives. Um, so the report uh, was then passed on to the archive committee that the House had set up, and, and I and Michael spoke to the archive committee and answered the questions they had about our recommendations. Um, and then ultimately, the archive committees passed those uh, their recommendation to the, the board of trustees. Um, and at the end of the project, we also had the chance to speak to the World Council of Alumni, which is a very active alumni group at International House, and give them an overview of the archive project. Uh, we also, the two archivists who worked on the survey, brought up some did a sort of show and tell of 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 materials from the basement, and that got people very excited about the collections, and it was also a good way of uh, developing interest in sort of a broader stakeholder audience and, and, and also laying the foundation for some fundraising. Um, let's see. In terms of outcomes, the first two points were really the, uh, what Winthrop was tasked with. This, uh, the first point, uh, we were able to at least begin to stabilize the, the, the collections. Um, and I'll, we had a very uh, pretty detailed spreadsheet that has been used since the end of the project to find archival materials. Um, so I, I think we, we did succeed in, in at least providing some baseline uh, control. Um, and then the, the roadmap itself um, did lay out, the, as I mentioned, these, these options mission statement, the work plan, and, and sort of this is how you would go about, it, as well as sort of considering what are the pros and cons of, of, of depositing materials at Rockefeller Archive Center um, or maintaining them at, at the house. Um, the stakeholder interviews were also incredibly important, as I, as I mentioned, because they just provided this sort of different perspectives around the house of, of how the records could be used going forward. Um, communications development, we're very, very interested in the possibility of using the records as were programs, uh, admissions. I mean, everyone could see a possible use for, for records. So that I tried to convey that, that excitement within the, um, within the report. Uh, All right, so I was talking about uh, short-term funding for the archives. Um, emphasis on the word short-term. Uh, over the next few years, we're going to be seeking more funding. Uh, we want to launch this as a long-term permanent project at the house with a strong information management component. Uh, the findings and recommendations report was also pivotal in helping us uh, actually launch the archive program and recruitment for a lead archivist. If all goes according to plan, we'll welcome our lead archivist sometime next month to be followed by a full archive team including two resident archivists. We're going to engage our entire community at International House in this project. Um, as Sam mentioned, we're going to keep the archives on site. And uh, of course, Winthrop's work was pivotal in helping, helping us get here. So Sam and I wanted to show you uh, a little bit about what International House has been able to accomplish just in the previous year, even with its current limited archives. Uh, on the left, or maybe you're right, you'll see um, an event that was done with a president um, who was president of the House back in the 1980s in conversation with our current president. We brought him back. That president had been involved in a building expansion project, so history does indeed repeat itself. Um, earlier this year, we did an event um, about David Rockefeller and his relationship with International House. And uh, we're pleased to report that we were able to source something like, I think, 40% of the documents in that book and for that event from our archives. All right, so we'll touch on stakeholder strategies now. So we're just going to quickly touch on a few of the strategies that we used in, in helping decision makers uh, understand the importance of this project and, and try and, and fund it. Um, so. An obvious one, perhaps, is the defining the costs associated with establishing an archives program. Um, the, if you think of an archives as an investment, or at least establishing one and, and running one, it's a financial investment in archival facilities, professional staffing, uh, supplies, collections management system, many other things. It's also an investment in the present and future of your organization, um, however, not 
all stakeholders under, value the hi history or, or see that as a compelling reason to have an archive. So regardless of what the varying perspectives of those stakeholders, you want to be able to uh, tie sort of, well, your decision makers are going to need to know the costs associated with setting up and running an archive and being able to define clear goals and objectives for the archive that are tied to a specific timetable. And so I think that's one thing that we both found very useful for skeptical stakeholders. And then in terms of uh, the second sounding the alarm, there were obvious, uh, from anyone who walked through the basement, the, the house was not properly managing its historical resources. Uh, they were disorganized, inaccessible, vulnerable to loss, and the vulnerability was actually something that was not hypothetical, it was real. Uh, there had been a flood right before the Winthrop project started that, that uh, damaged a small group of, of records. So I think that, that, the, that experience obviously was a catalyst for, for taking better care of these. And so also thinking about what would the house lose if it were to lose the archives and, and thinking about those, the cost of inaction. Uh, we also identified and communicated how archives could be used across the organization. Sam and I both think that this is absolutely crucial. Um, at International House, we've believed in a very realistic approach to moving the project forward and not being purists or idealists. Um, talking to people about the project in a language that matters to them. Uh, we've also empowered our stakeholders. We believe that this, believe, that this will lead to a multiplier effect and to momentum around the project. We want people to feel invested in this project. So with right. that, I think yeah, we'll we're step away from this. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So our key takeaways, uh, the first are personal connections. So I think while we can do things like Skype or connect virtually with people, just being there in person with people in the country office was such an incredible experience. Um, sitting down with somebody, hearing their stories, their experience, and capturing some of that on audio. I think that we got some amazing stories that I just think we would not have captured otherwise. Um, the other component of that, I think, has to do with being able to now build off of those connections. So now um, Amy has a point of reference, a contact, allies in the, that office that she can call on when she needs support. Um, and we can continue to build and foster those relationships. Um, I think those are the two points on that. And then um, another key takeaway was that we needed to set clear expectations. And this sounds so obvious. Um, apparently, people in the India office can't read our minds. So um, being more clear about what our needs and requirements were for the visit, um, there were several missed opportunities. So I think going forward, we would be um, more specific and clear to list out that we need a point of contact that's knowledgeable about both the people and the work in the office, has a portfolio-wide view of the things that are happening, um, someone that can give us advocacy support and support the visit um, at the highest level to promote it, articulate the value of the archive to the staff and the foundation. While we know that clearly, we needed somebody on the ground to help us communicate that. And then also scheduling and integration assistance. So we missed an opportunity uh, to join an all staff meeting. So it would be great to just be more aware of what meetings were taking place while we were there um, and other opportunities um, uh, for things like visits um, or you know places where we could plug in. Um, so these things will all um, help us as we plan our next visit and we'll take these things with us. Okay, and then last but not least, stay flexible. Um, we, you know, things did not go as we had planned at all. And like Amy mentioned, we could have just scrapped it and started from scratch, but we stuck with it and we said, okay, how do we make this work? 
where, how do we meet people where they are? And it was clear that um, we just needed to find creative solutions. Uh, we also, because we were a little bit flexible, well, we were quite flexible, um, we just learned about some events that we would not have otherwise planned to attend. Like when we arrived early in the morning, um, later that day, it was quite early, I think it was like three in the morning, later that day, we um, actually just on our flight ran into somebody and they were doing a site visit and they invited us. So we got to go on a completely unplanned site visit and that was just really good for um, being present with our uh, some of the foundation leadership and just even showing up. So I think navigating ambiguous times paid off. Okay, so um, from our project, we learned, you know, a, a number of different things. One, you know, we learned a lot about the people who were involved. And, you know, I'm just going to stop for a second so you have the context here. The MasterCard company was a, created as an association of banks. And by the 1990s, those banks were setting rates. Companies like Walmart didn't like the rates they were setting and accused them essentially of colluding to set those rates which violated antitrust law. There were lots of big lawsuits back and forth, and finally MasterCard decided, and Visa would later decide the same thing, but that it was better just to spin MasterCard off as an independent company and reduce the bank's ownership below 50% so they couldn't be accused of that anymore. So they said, well, wait, we don't want to um, risk that someone's going to come in and buy up the company. What can we do? The European board members said, let's take 10% of the company and give it away and create a private independent foundation with it. 10% uh, of the company in 2006 at the time of the IPO was worth about $500 million. But they said, we're going to lock up the stock. We're going to tell the foundation they have to hold on to the stock for 21 years. You know, they can use what they need to meet their requirements, but hold on to the stock for 21 years. Well, <laughs> the stock did quite well. Even before they could really get a CEO in place, that $500 million had increased to $2.5 billion. And what is it today, Justine? 26.5 billion from 500 million in 2006. You can imagine the management challenges that raises in terms of getting money out Rare. the door. <laughs> but the other thing about the antitrust environment was, and this is what the oral history showed and in, in, the, in the research showed, was that because MasterCard had to really make it clear that this was gonna be, that, that they were doing everything squeaky clean they went through an elaborate process of really high levels of picking the right people, going through extreme due diligence, and as a result, they got great people, they got really important content, who came up with really important content, and they developed processes and made decisions that were really smart about how they would target their resources. MasterCard said, we're giving you this money, their donor intent was you had to do it in microfinance and on youth and education. The board made the decision to focus on Africa, and out of that process, they developed tools that would allow them to do that, and particularly their partnership strategy. Mistakes were made along the way, and sometimes those get forgotten in the corporate culture. The first CEO, the board said, we have to hire a technocrat, someone who understands microfinance. So they hired someone based on that skill. Well, that person quickly decided this was not the right job for them. And when they went out and had to hire a new CEO, not having yet even made a grant, or at least a substantial one, they had totally different criteria. This time, they were looking for leadership, someone who could really be inspirational, and they got Rita Roy. And she still is, to this day, incredibly inspirational. Every single time I hear her speak, I'm reminded why I'm here. Um, so uh, I'll just speak a, a bit more about kind of these four categories of lessons learned and how they shaped the KM program and and really the way that we approach our work. So um, one, one thing about the people is, you know, outsource. It's going to take time to build your teams. Uh, do whatever you can to bring that expertise into your organizations so that you've got the skills and the, the capabilities that you need to do the work. Um, and over time, you're going to be able to bring that capacity into the organization. Uh, but just because you don't have it doesn't mean that y y you shouldn't go out and, and seek it elsewhere. Uh, we had to do that. Oh, my. So sorry about that. We, we had to do that for a while. And in fact, we're still relying uh, uh, exclusively, uh, no, sorry, not exclusively, but quite heavily on, on external resources. Um, I need glasses. Uh, <laughs> oh. 
The other piece about the teams is really building teams, whether they're external or internal, building teams where there's shared sets of values, but there may be contrasting uh, skill sets. And you know, it, it creates a little friction, but that friction is good. It really does drive innovation and um, it drives creativity. Um, around the content, I just want to add one piece around you know, this concept of broadening our definition of evidence. Uh, when I when I when I talk about you know evidence, we we are a, we are a very analytical organization. We have a lot of people with PhDs, and they immediately go to kind of data and evidence that's been generated through academic processes. Um, that is one slice of the evidence puzzle. When we're talking about telling stories and shaping narratives. Data and storytelling are two sides of the same coin. Broaden that definition of evidence to include field experience, to include informed opinion. All of that counts so that you can drive content toward those um, people who are making decisions. So it's like understand the decision-making space uh, of your leaders and then work backwards from there. Uh, that will really be able to help you. <laughs> I, I mean, at least in my experience, it's really been able to help me sell KM, IM, records, everything related. If I understand the decision-making challenges and the decision-making priorities of people in the organization, and frankly, also our partners. So um, I'd say everything can kind of spill from there if you, you know, understand that decision-making space. In terms of our lessons learned, um, trust and open dialogue, this may be a no-brainer, but it, we really felt that uh, for this project it was uh, important since we were both learning, both IHouse and Winthrop were learning a lot just to keep the lines of communication open and to sort of share what we were learning around, uh, over the course of the project, uh, especially since developing a sense of the organizational dynamics and the different perspectives of stakeholders. I think we had to have a pretty nuanced understanding of, of what was happening at the house, and so that was was really vital to have. Um, and then stewardship and taking responsibility for the past. Um, we also found that as a, a major motivator. Um, we referenced before the idea of sounding the alarm about the precarious state of the archives or the archival records. Um, that is obviously can be effective, uh, but at the same time, fear of potential loss shouldn't be your only advocacy tool. And really thinking about uh, people making a commitment, a positive commitment to the future. I mean, um, I think that's one one thing we thought was important. Uh, importance of multiple stakeholder conversations. As Sam mentioned, uh, Winthrop spoke with 19 stakeholders. And since Winthrop's work, I've come to the belief that it's almost impossible to have too many conversations with stakeholders to figure out what matters to them and to speak in their language. Who has the decision-making authority? How can you speak to them to move a project along? And by having multiple conversations with stakeholders, it also helps us understand um, where are the potholes? Where are some potential things that we need to be aware of? Um, what can we sort of get in front of before they become big problems? Uh, Sam and I have also talked a lot about flexibility and taking advantage of unexpected opportunities. So as Sam mentioned, uh, we made a presentation to a huge alumni group uh, last year. Um, we're really continuing to be aware, to be mindful, to be sort of in the moment and adapting our conversations to um, uh, this project. Uh, to anyone who's sort of interested, we're happy to talk with them about this project. And uh, we think that by talking with people about the project, they will then talk to others about the project. So it's almost a self-perpetuating effect. Thank you all so much. That was awesome. Um, so we are going to open the floor for Q&A for the next 10 to 15 minutes. So who's got a question? Take your time. Yeah, excellent. You mentioned that at International House, 
you um, are you are uh, um, you're maintaining your archives on site. Um, are do you have the physical capacity f for that, or are you using any remote, I don't know, storage or anything else? Yes, we do have the physical capacity right now, and as part of the new building project, we're actually going to be permanently rehousing the archives in a new room. Um, we've also had a lot of conversations about how we can bring the archives out of that room and to create exhibitions around them. There have been a lot of conversations about how we can leverage these archives, and um, we're very fortunate to be able to house them at the house. How has, I'm sorry, how has formalizing your programs uh, impacted your institutions? I'll take a stab at this one because we're, we're, we're actually going through the process of formalizing. Uh, we're, we, we take stabs at formalizing in iterative cycles. So it's happening on an ongoing basis where we refine, um, and sometimes we even redefine what it means to be formal. Sometimes in the past, formal has been bureaucratic, and now formal is about streamlining and delegating authority and uh, being nimble and agile. So I would actually say that for our organization, it's the other way around. So when we look at our, it's, it's not that the formalization has impacted the organization. The organization's desire for impact has driven our concept of what it means to be formal and, and what it means to formalize our systems. And so I guess um, what it's forced me to do is not be married to any kind of one concept of what it means to be a good organization. Um, that that has changed over time, depending on the needs of the organization. Uh, you know, right now our priority is opening offices in, in Africa, which means that we need to think about what it will take to decentralize, um, but a, a balance off the, and identify what needs to remain centralized in order for there to be some cohesion from a cultural perspective and from an, a kind of an operating perspective. Um, but that wasn't the definition of formalizing five years ago. So I guess I'd just say that it really does need to, to be reversed. You look at your organization strategy, look what it calls you to do, and then, you know, for, for at least me, I've had to redefine what it means to formalize many, many times. Yes, please. <coughs> this is a question. To um, we're going to get a mic to you. This is a question to the representatives from the Gates Foundation. You mentioned that it was a combined archives of family and foundation. How did you go about resolving conflicts, perhaps in your own mind, between what belonged to family and what belonged to the foundation? That's a really good question. Um, and it's one that we still kind of work through, to be really honest. I mean, I think that, especially in today's age, um, the way that people create records is just really different. And it's not as clearly defined what might be with one or the other. Um, so I think as we learned a little bit more about, and as we built the collections, we were able to look at what we had. Often the records will speak to you. Um, and it became clear to us certain categories of things that might just be better suited for being personal papers because it was clearly um, somebody's per, you know copy of something versus an official business record. So that does really does result often in some duplication perhaps, but that's something we're accepting and that helps minimize the conflict. I have a question I'll take the opportunity to ask. Um, Everyone talked about the need to be flexible. Um, and as information professionals, I feel like we're always looking to give, like provide information, provide access, um, to be flexible so that we can build relationships. Um, and I was wondering if you all had any thoughts about those places where you feel like you can't be flexible. Um, so if you had to draw a line in the cement that you couldn't, you know, brush out and take a step back and let people cross. Um, is, is there a place for you all 
um, either in, in the, the projects that you've worked on for this panel um, or just in your professional lives where you feel like we shouldn't be flexible um, as, a, as a people, as a profession? Well, one thing comes to mind, thinking back about our um, site visit, is I think we're really flexible about the how, but not the what. So our goals about we need to capture staff's reflections and stories. We need to capture their materials. Um, there are certain goals and things that we we were we would be inflexible about, but you know how we did that, um, we were completely flexible. So. Um, I think the mission and, and goals for our trip and the outcomes that we achieved um, were great and we were willing to do whatever we needed to do to make that happen. Um, and so that's where the flexibility was, trying to make it easy for other people so we could achieve our goals. Um, kind of is what comes to mind. Two things come to mind for me, but I'll also check in with Eric. Um, one is executive sponsorship. So you, I, I, I have learned the hard way just not to proceed without it. I'm not flexible about that any longer. If there isn't buy-in at the top, then I don't proceed. I, I keep the, the plan in my back pocket, but I save it for that day when somebody says, oh, wouldn't it be great if? I'm like, yes, it would. <laughs> and I've got the plan. <laughs> so that's one thing. I think the other thing, and, and for anybody who's like a pure information scientist or manager in the room, it's metadata. And I know that it's the, the, the bane of the existence of almost all of our employees, but it has to be done. And we, we never stop talking about why. I would just add that uh, for me, having professional archivists actually undertake the work, at least the parts where they're needed, is really important um, so that it's not unleashing the interns on, on the boxes and, see, and seeing what happens. Um, so that would be one thing. And then I was also thinking about advocating for the records themselves. And at a certain point, if an organization is not taking care of its records, when does it say, well, maybe it makes sense to transfer them to someone who will take care of them? Um, I'll just add sort of from a storyteller's perspective as a historian, you know, one of the concerns people often have with us because we're often writing history that's sponsored is, well, you're just writing what they want you to say. And we work very hard not to do that. And one of the things that we work hard to do is to persuade executives that uh, a complex story is better for their organization than a simple story of triumph. Um, that failure is more often more instructive than success, and that you can um, tell very difficult stories um, if you treat everybody with respect and don't throw people under the bus and allow different perspectives. Um, most of the time, you can tell a story that honors people in the process, even though there are winners and losers. And we find that most of the time, if we work that through with the executives, we're able to tell what I think are remarkably candid stories. So we'll, one more opportunity, if there are any questions over here. Thanks. Um, I had a question for uh, those of you involved in or oral history, and um, that is, how are you making the oral histories and the transcripts available to researchers? What uh, technologies or what, what is your approach, if, if they're already available to, to outside people? Um, I'll go first because my answer is pretty straightforward. Um, since we are a private archive, they are not currently available to research. Um, that being said, we are making sure that for the audio or video files, um, that those are preserved in our digital preservation system. So should that time come, they would be made available and then we would figure out the best way. So um, we're, we will do two things. We're not doing them yet. But one is definitely um, uh, uh, adopting metadata standards that would allow discovery. And um, the other thing is really looking at the open access culture and then inherent policies that are required to, to, to implement an open access um, approach. But that is definitely taking time, and it's the long game. I'm, I'm not losing sight of it, but I'm really working very carefully and strategically 
year after year to get us to that point. Um, the case studies that there, Eric referred to earlier, they were actually never published externally, uh, not even circulated internally. Into, but I'm working on that now. So it's like step by step by step, just continuing to be persistent and consistent about those values, um, and then and then the ch and, uh, adopting the tools that are available externally that will allow this, this content to, to flourish in the world. Okay. I'll, I'll just add oh. one other response, sort of general. We do a lot of oral histories, and we do them according to the, first of all, ground rules of the client, what, what they need for their organization, but two, absolutely the ground rules of the interviewee. You know, my philosophy is that um, better to get the interviewee to participate under whatever ground rules um, than to not participate at all. So we do interviews sometimes where it, we only do audio. We create a transcript. The transcript gets edited in collaboration with the interviewee, and that interview may be sealed for, until, for the rest of their life. Usually that's the limit. Um, and people may be frustrated that that doesn't get out there as quickly as some would like, but my feeling is those are the ground rules under the which that person will choose to participate and be as candid as, as you can get them to be. And so um, we always deal with the interviewee wherever they are. We meet them there. All right, so that will wrap up the final panel of the day. Thank you all so much. <laughs>